There were discussions with the palace in the lead up. There was no discussion about the dismissal or pulling the trigger itself. So what do we take out of that? Well, look, this is an extraordinary um, insight into the events of 1975 from the view at Yarralumla, where the Governor-General was, and also from Buckingham Palace, back and forth, a lot of discussion, a lot of debate about issues, a lot of, a lot of questions raised by the Governor-General about how he's going to resolve this crisis over the deadlock in passing the budget in the Senate. Um, and so it's really fascinating to look at these letters. But what they show is that the Queen did not have advanced knowledge of the dismissal mm. and did not approve of it afterwards. So there's no evidence for that. And so the claim made by Jenny Hocking, the most extraordinary, uh, sensational claim made, uh, that there was a grand conspiracy here, has not been held up by these documents. In fact, that view has been completely demolished. Um, but nevertheless, there are some somewhat troubling aspects to this correspondence, which is the discussion about reserve powers, uh, about how Kerr should handle uh, Gough Whitlam or Malcolm Fraser, some of these things. Um, and so okay. it's great, great fodder for historians. So on that, she's stood up today and said what this does confirm is there was discussion of the power. She called it the contested, debated reserve power, and she took some of the responses from the palace to be a green light to what Kerr was mulling over in terms of using that power. What do you think of that? Uh, well, I don't agree with that, and I don't think the letters uh, demonstrate that at all. I mean, what the letters show is a discussion uh, essentially about, about the reserve powers in relation to dissolving the parliament, not necessarily dismissing the prime minister. But the idea... Is the effect the same, though? Uh, no, it's not necessarily, but the idea of dismissing a, a Prime Minister was something that had been raised by the opposition. I mean, Malcolm Fraser was effectively mm. calling for that. Uh, the opposition spokesman um, at the time, opposition frontbencher Bob Ellicott, had written a legal opinion on the 16th of October which effectively recommended that. I mean, newspapers were calling for it. So mm. it's an idea that was part of the live discussion for possible resolution of the crisis. So it's not unusual uh, that Kerr would be raising these things. But there's no suggestion in the letters uh, that the palace said, yes, you should dismiss the Prime Minister. Is there a possibility, though, by the palace saying that Kerr was acting in the right way, for example, um, acting carefully and so on, when they talk about his um, considerations, that he felt more confidence in his position because of the correspondence from the palace? I think we need to look at this with a little bit of nuance. I mean, John Kerr was someone who craved reassurance. Um, he sought it from Garfield Barwick. He sought it privately from Anthony Mason, a fellow High Court judge. Um, mm. And he sought it from Martin Charteris, the Queen's uh, uh, private secretary. So, so he's someone who's looking for this sort of buffering up uh, mentality well, he's that, he, that, that he's on track. Time, that, 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 that's right. And so, but what, in, the, in the letters, when, when Martin Charteris refers uh, to using the reserve powers... He says, he says, use them only as a last resort, only when there's no other alternative available. And he says in this letter that uh, it's a very heavy responsibility uh, that you should, that you have in, in weighing up whether or not to mm. use these powers. Uh, but in terms of your point about whether they thanked Kerr, they did thank Kerr. They thanked Kerr for not telling the Queen in advance, keeping her out of it. Mm. And so there's letters before and after the dismissal from the palace saying, whatever you do in Australia, mm. keep the Queen out of it. And so they thanked him for doing that. So that keeps her out of it directly in terms of anyone saying the Queen sacked the PM. But again, when he's saying only use these powers in the, in, as a last resort, doesn't that also confirm that from the palace's point of view that power exists? Uh, well, I don't think there's any doubt that the power exists. It was used um, and it was never challenged. So we know the reserve power um, exists. But, yes, there was a live constitutional debate at the time about whether these powers had fallen into some kind of disuse. Um, but, in fact, Kerr showed that they, they did exist. And the fact that Martin Charter has said they do exist uh, doesn't necessarily mean that he was saying you should use them, simply that they, that they exist. Um, so I think at the end of the day, what we see here is a titanic clash of personalities, very strong-willed people. You know, the Senate blocking supply, the Prime Minister refusing to go to an election, uh, the country is gridlocked, John Kerr had to find some solution to the mm. crisis. I don't think he found the right solution. I don't think that dismissal by ambush after operating in secret without warning to the Prime Minister was the right way to do it at all, and he's been properly criticised for that. Uh, but the idea that there would be a grand conspiracy where the Queen knew about the dismissal and, and then authorised it has, has been completely debunked by the letters today. The other aspect was that the, the palace said it would take unkindly on a call for Gough Whitlam to actually sack Sir John Kerr. 
but it said it would still have to oblige. Yeah, look, it's a bit there's, there's, both sides, isn't it? That well, they're, they're well, having a view on what sort of call it would be made, but they'd still obey. Yes, I, I think we need to understand there's going to be a little bit of flattery here. The, the Governor-General's writing privately to the Queen's Private Secretary. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of flattery there on either side. But the, in the final analysis, uh, John Kerr feared his own recall. He feared that he would, in fact, be dismissed by Gough Whitlam. And when he asked the Palace what would happen if Gough Whitlam recommended that he be dismissed, John Kerr, the Palace said the Queen will follow the Prime Minister's advice. So in the yeah. final analysis... Uh, that is what would have happened. The Queen will have, would have followed the Prime Minister's advice. What does it say about the existing system we still have in place, that, first of all, a Governor-General has this power, and, second of all, I suppose, the strange situation, because what we heard in terms of the lead-up to all of this, and we heard about Sir John Kerr's fears that he would be sacked by Whitlam, and he was very fearful for his own position, that two people in these positions can sack each other. Yes, uh, that's true. Um, and, and this system remains largely in place. I mean, there's been very little change to the constitutional political situation since 1975. There's been a change about the appointment of senators um, but uh, and the election of senators and terms and things like that. But, look, this crisis could happen again. Yeah. I think it's unlikely uh, because we're unlikely to see such a, a testing of institutions like we saw in 1975 and the, and the very strong-willed personalities. Uh, when uh, Paul Kelly and I read a book about the dismissal five years ago, uh, we surveyed um, a lot of the senior members of the Liberal Party at the time, former Prime Ministers, uh, deputy leaders and so on, and they said that they would not have done... Um, what Malcolm Fraser did. So I think there's a, there's a recognition today across the political divide uh, that Malcolm Fraser and the Liberal Party pushed the political system to the limits, to the brink, uh, and they paid a price for that. Um, but Gough Whitlam made plenty of blunders uh, along the way. Certainly did. Look, there'd have to be a whole other program on the various scandals on the Whitlam government. But, I mean, that's the interesting question at the end of this, when you say this is the system, this could happen again, when the debate comes up, about whether we become a republic, you say, oh, well, how could you sort it out? You know, what sort of um, position would you be left in? Well, could it be any worse in this strange situation that afforded this constitutional crisis? Well, true, and unless we want to spend the next 20 years at constitutional conventions rewriting a new constitution, uh, I think we're largely stuck with the system that we've got. And, of course, at the 1999 referendum and in the proposal that Paul Keating put to the parliament in 1995, he recommended that the new president basically takes over the role of the Governor-General and has the same powers. And Keating also recommended that those powers not be codified. Mm. So that means that the reserve powers not be spelt out. And so they remain somewhat mysterious in how they can be used and when they can be used. The strange thing about this, just finally, when it happened, of course, so if we remind ourselves um, the powers used, so Whitlam was dismissed, Whitlam wasn't told at the time, meanwhile, that, um, of course, Fraser, Malcolm Fraser, become Prime Minister... But he used a motion in Parliament to get a majority motion calling on his government essentially to be reinstated. Now, when the Speaker went to have a meeting with the Governor-General, the gates were locked. That's right. He didn't right. allow him in. And as a result, an election was called instead. It strikes me that that's almost the only way you can do it. If he's got a power, but the government day has a majority, well, they just go back and forth. You get dismissed, you win a vote in Parliament. You get dismissed, you win a vote in there, Parliament. There is a fascinating series of other records, Tom, in the National Archives left by John Kerr. Lots of handwritten notes, type notes about all of these events. He decided that in the afternoon after the dismissal, even though the House had passed a no-confidence motion and Malcolm Fraser, uh, that he would go on with it. Malcolm Fraser had delivered the terms of his caretaker commission which essentially was to, to pass supply and recommend an election. And so John Kerr kept exercising those reserve powers uh, to dissolve the parliament for an election. Uh, and it was a messy afternoon, mm. um, but it was one that he thought was essential to send this crisis, essentially uh, to resolve the crisis and, and send the parliament off to an election. Well, that debate, I suspect, will continue. But Troy Bramston, thanks for your time. Thank you.